welcome friends <clears throat> i'm very happy to come to florida again and see so many friends here some new and some i'm meeting first time but they're all friends our friendship does not come from knowing each other here our friendship comes because at one time long ago we were all one we divided ourselves into many so that we could experience what our true nature was our true nature when we were one was love people say god is love that the highest truth is love why do they give so much importance to love because love is the most important thing that you can ever experience in this or any other life when they think that god created everything and god is in everything that god is omnipresent god is omnipotent god is omniscient we regard god as the source of everything and they say god is love then love must be the source of everything love is love but not a lover not a beloved the one becomes the many so that love can become a lover and a beloved people ask if we were so happy in our state of oneness what was the need for having so many what's the need of creation the creation has come into being so that love can become an experience by creating lovers and beloveds otherwise love is just a quality of totality and not an experience to further enhance this experience amongst the many we have been given a beautiful gift a nice device called the human mind the human mind is not our self love and consciousness and our soul as we call it is our true self which is not the mind we don't function in time and space we function in a timeless spontaneous state when we experience love it doesn't happen over time it happens suddenly spontaneously love does not require time and space to happen on the other hand the mind functions only in time and space even the sm smallest thought the shortest thought takes time therefore there is a big distinction between our own self which is love or soul and the mind that has been given to us to expand the exp experience of love so that we can now have love lovers and beloveds not only in a state of zero time and zero space but in an expanded universe and not only one universe several universes of different levels of experiences the largest of these universes which creates all other universes we call the causal plane of consciousness or the causal plane of awareness the causal plane is nothing but that which causes everything to happen everything we see here has been created from the causal plane by the help of this equipment we call the mind the mind is like a giant computer there is one giant computer sitting somewhere which we can discover and that is sometimes also referred to as the universal mind in that universal mind there are several programs which can be separated and those several programs are called individual minds and we are using those several individuated programs in with our souls and we think we are using a mind of our own we are still participating in the same universal mind we are just using part of it and because we are using it separated therefore we think we have our own mind 
and we think with our own minds, we make sense of things with our own mind, and we rationalize things with our own mind, we use logic to understand things, and we do many other things with our mind which helps us to enjoy our experience as our identity of love. We create attachments, a little modified form of love, so that we can create more objects, more people around us and experience love in the form of an attachment. That also is done very well with our human mind. So the human mind is performing great functions at the causal level of experience and it is a great boon to have been given such a beautiful computer called the human mind that can create a whole world of separation and variety. But that is not all. The perception which we need for any experience, the perception that the mind can give us can be further divided into separate sense perceptions. You could have perception of anything at one go, but you can also divide it separately into seeing and hearing and touching, tasting and smelling. These are not actually separate. We are dividing them into separation to give a greater variety of experience to the, to the self. With the use of the mind, we create another level of experiences where we divide our mental perception, which was total, into divided perception of different sense perceptions. That creates a new world for us. Beautiful world where now we can see things, hear things, touch things, smell, taste. What a great variety of experiences coming from a single perception divided into five. So a new, new level of creation comes up, which we now call the astral self, the astral level of consciousness. Why we call it astral? Because in this world where we have to experience with our five senses, we generate a new sky. That means a new universe. The sky is often referred to as an astral thing. So that is why we call this state of being as an astral state of consciousness and we are able to enjoy all the created things through the sense perceptions. It's wonderful. We are using it all the time. Right now, while we are sitting here, we imagine we are flying up in the sky. Any one of us can do that imagination. We are just using the astral form of consciousness within ourselves to imagine we are flying. If we think we are flying, we are sitting here with our physical bodies, then how are we flying? We are flying with our imaginary bodies. What's the difference between an imaginary body and a physical body? There's only one difference. The imaginary body has no matter in it and physical body has matter. When we add matter, physical atoms and molecules, what we call matter, to our imaginary self, we become physical bodies. And a new form of life is created, a new level of experience is created, which we call the physical level of experience. We are currently in the physical level of experience using material bodies, physical bodies, to house within it our soul, using a mind and sense perceptions. All of them are intact. Without soul, there will be no life, no consciousness. There our true self is consciousness and life. We are having around it a mind that creates space and time and creates reasoning, creates logic and creates all the functions that can take place in space and time. And around that we have another form of ours called the imaginary body or the astral self which contains all the sense perceptions without the matter. Then we have the matter added on and we get a physical body. We are such composite beings all put together in one physical body right now. 
Now, what is this strange kind of creation that we created from inside out? We never created from outside in. We created from life itself, from totality of consciousness itself, and added on around it time and space through mind, added it around it, sense perceptions divided, added around it a physical body, and added around it a material world. If we understand the secret of creation, that the creation never took place from anywhere outside, all we experience as creation has taken place from within out. Therefore, when somebody comes on a spiritual path and says, I want to find the ultimate truth, all these mystics and these experienced people say, go within. Why are they saying go within? Because the whole thing, drama, started from within and worked outwards. It never started from outside. That is why the secret of discovering how all this creation took place, why it took place, what's the purpose of our being here, why did we do all this, the secret is all lying within ourselves. If we want to find who we really are, that means not the mind, not the sense perceptions, not the physical body, who are we as life itself, as the unit of consciousness that operated within the totality called God. Who are we really? That the way is clearly go within yourself and not outside. We can go within ourselves by simple means also given to us as human beings. We do not have those means in any other form of life. There are lots of forms of life. We see small insects crawling, we see birds flying, we see mammals, we see animals, horses, donkeys, cats, dogs, all moving around. We see birds flying, we see, some of us can see, angels, guardian angels. Some of us believe there are some gods who are taking care of us. Some believe that gods are creating, many, several levels of gods are there. So many faiths are there referring to different forms of life. But how come that out of all these forms of life, listed at one place in India as 8.4 million forms of life? 8.4 million, out of which the description says 5.6 million, more than half of it, is in the plant kingdom. Plants as we see them on the surface of the planet and far more that lie under the oceans, under the water. Those constitute most of life. We never even see them and they don't see us. Those plants cannot do what we can do. The birds cannot do what we can do. Dogs and cats cannot do what we can do. Angels cannot do what we can do. And what is that which we can do, which no other form of life can do? We can seek to discover the truth. We can seek God. We can become a seeker. This is great. People do not realize the importance of this big function available to human beings, the ability to seek. Seek anything. And who seeks? When we become a seeker, have we ever realized who is seeking? Do we think the mind is seeking? The mind cannot seek. What can the mind do? Mind can search. Big difference between searching and seeking. Searching means searching something you believe already is there. Seeking is what we don't know what is there. That is why the mind searches all the time different things. Mind is curious. But the one in us that seeks is not curious. It's seeking to go where it belongs. The feeling comes within us that we belong somewhere, that there is a truth somewhere, hiding somewhere. We want to seek that. This ability to seek is unique to human beings. And the search of the mind is different. Mind cannot search anything 
that is not in time and space. It always searches things which it can call people and objects which all exist in time and space. But the soul in us, our real self, is seeking without knowing what it is seeking. Why does it not know clearly? It has to coin some phrase, I want to seek the truth, I want to seek my true home, I want to see where I belong, I want to see the meaning of life, I want to see why I am here. Why are you putting these questions? They are all saying the same thing. I am seeking, who am I? Really? This whole seeking is to discover who we really are. Socrates, the great philosopher said, know thyself. If you know yourself, all the questions are answered. But the self is not the body. It's a cover on the self. Very temporary cover. It's not sense perceptions. We created them as a second level of experience. Not the mind. A thinking mind is also a cover. We created it to have experience in time and space. Then who are we hiding behind all these three? That's the self. When we say, I am seeker, you are seeking the self. And the way to the self is to go within these three covers, which have been created outside of ourself, around ourself. Now, is it very difficult to do this? If we just say theoretically, it looks impossible. Because we can't even see how these three covers are working upon us. We take the composite self of ours, the whole says, whole body of ours, and wonder how can one go within oneself? What is within oneself? But if we are real seekers, we can discover a few things very easily. One, if we are seeking the self, we should seek the one who is saying, I am seeking. If we are seeking the self, we should listen to what is being said inside ourselves, not with the tongue, inside ourselves, who am I? Now, if we don't want to get an answer from outside, we can close our eyes to be less distracted. We can go to a quiet place, not to be distracted when we put this question. We close our eyes, sit comfortably, quietly, and ask a question, who am I? And the next step, who is asking this question? And from where? That should be simple. Who is asking this question, who am I? Is also obviously a voice inside yourself. Maybe your mind is making up these words and saying, who am I? <coughs> where is it doing it? In the human body, where is this voice taking place? Where is this thought coming from? It does not take long for you to know it's not coming in your hands. It's not coming from your legs and feet. It's not even coming from your torso. It's not even coming from your heart. It's coming from your head. That doesn't take long to find out. Ask it again and again if you are not sure where it's coming from. You say it's coming not only from the head, small part of the head behind the eyes. Doesn't take long. That you are in the wakeful state in a human body asking this question from a point behind these eyes within your head. What a wonderful discovery. Now you know where you are. Next step will be to find out who you are. If you can first know where you are, then it becomes easy to find something. So once you know that when we are in a human body, the one that is seeking is sitting behind the eyes in the center. You can even draw this sit location closer to that. Where exactly? The right side of the head, left side, lower part, higher part, check. You will find it right behind the eyes, right in the center between the two eyes. 
It's very important point. Why do we have two eyes to see? Why not one eye? We could have had one eye. They say they were cyclops, used to have one eye. They had a big problem. They never knew where they were. Why? Because unless you have two eyes, you cannot create distance. Did you know that? That if we did not have two eyes, we would have very big problem of what is far and what is near. Why is that? Because the two eyes don't see the same thing. They are not placed in one place. If it is one place, we would see one picture. And this is very simple. I sometimes tell my little kids, put a finger in front of you and look at the distance. You will see two fingers. One is very clear, one is a little vague. You close one eye, one finger is there, the other eye, finger is somewhere else. You are seeing two fingers. And if you concentrate on one finger, put your eyes together, then everybody else is two. How come we are seeing two different pictures on the two different eyes, but when we look outside, we see one? Where are we combining them? We are not seeing outside of the eye, we are seeing inside of the eyes. But we are not seeing in the eyes. In the eyes, we will see two pictures. Then where are we seeing one picture? Consider this carefully. Where are we seeing one picture? Do you know we are seeing this one picture exactly at the same point where we ask the question, who am I? Right behind the eyes at the center. It's a remarkable it's a scientific truth. What I am sharing with you is, is a daily experience that when we look at the world with two eyes, we are seeing one image and the combination is taking place not by wearing glasses, polaroid glasses or something. Combination is taking place inside as a third eye center, which is right in the center. We call it third eye center. <clears throat> third eye center means nothing except our state of location in the wakeful state in a human body. That's all. Some people think because of books, books say, Oh, go to third eye center, open your third eye center. I laugh when I read those books. They have no experience at all who write those things. We are always 24-7 when we are awake, we are at a third eye center. We cannot be anywhere else. What are we looking for then? There is no way that you can look at this world without being at the third eye center. Then what are those books selling? Open your third eye center. What eyes to be opened? We are opened already. The third eye center is from where we operate in the wakeful state. And that's the place where we ask the question, who am I? So that is why we are always at the third eye center. The only thing is that although we are operating from the third eye center, we have scattered ourselves. How did we scatter ourselves? We scattered ourselves by using our mind to think of other things, people and objects. When we think of something, part of our attention goes to what we think about. We buy a new car, beautiful car, we think of the car, there's a string of ours going right to the car. We have children, we have friends, we have parents, we have bosses and employees and our attentions are going. We scattered ourselves by putting attention on so many things. Not only putting attention on things, we get attached to those things. And when we get attached to people and things, we are constantly moving away from our center and instead of thinking, where am I? We are thinking of where they are, where those things are. And that is why we have just scattered our attention away and otherwise we are at third eye center. That's a big discovery. Because if you know that, then the only way to find out who you are is to withdraw your attention from everything to where it's scattered from. Simple. If you're scattering your attention in the wakeful state from a third eye center behind the eyes and everything is drawing your attention out because of attachments and desires of outside things, then 
try to withdraw these all these attachments back to your own self and say where am i operating from that i think of all these things outside in other words put your attention as much as you can on where you are putting your attention out from looks easy but we made it difficult why because all our life from infancy till death we have been using our attention to go out we have been taught focus your attention read a book focus your attention talking to people focus your attention on them continuously being trained to put our attention out never told how to put your attention in there is a big difference in the two to focus attention on something takes the attention away from ourselves to withdraw attention to yourself brings it back to where you are withdrawal of attention is the secret to discovering who you are simple instead of focusing attention on anything not even yourself the moment a person says i try to focus attention on myself what he does is he makes a picture of himself and tries to put attention on that which is not himself at all that's a picture the very concept of focusing attention takes us away from where we are withdrawal of attention is very different we never practiced it when we say that meditation can help us to discover ourselves it means meditating upon ourselves that means withdrawing attention on ourselves not on something the moment we start putting attention on something else is not withdrawal of attention and no good meditation people are meditating on outside things all the time if not outside they close their eyes and make an inner picture and meditate they see photos outside and bring the photo inside no matter what picture you make no matter what object you create inside no matter how many masters you create inside if you focus attention on something other than yourself you are not meditating usefully or efficiently the only meditation that succeeds is meditating upon yourself and the self is what you want to find if you find the self you will find god i can tell you god is hiding inside the self not outside the self that is looking at the world today is also hiding god within itself so we want to go further go within that self further and you will find the totality of creation inside yourself so that is why withdrawal of attention is very different so the meditation meditating is a simple word it just means contemplating thinking about something whatever we think about is meditating upon that thing we are meditating we are all meditators but we meditate upon worldly things we meditate upon our friends we meditate upon other people but we don't meditate on ourselves so when we want to meditate on ourselves we have very hard time because we never practice withdrawal of attention and we still try to focus somewhere and we get lost why are we try to focus there's an easier alternative don't try to focus anywhere your attention use the next best thing available to us called imagination who uses imagination our own self then you imagine you are sitting at a place where you are already are if you imagine you are sitting all you are doing is putting your attention where you already are so if you close your eyes and imagine you are sitting inside not creating a picture of yourself sitting there no that's not yourself the one looking at the picture is yourself therefore if you imagine you are sitting there like 
I am sitting on a chair, you are sitting on chairs now. Supposing we were to say the whole of our self, the physical self, has moved, shrunk and moved and gone in there and still sitting there with the eyes closed, then it becomes easier to imagine you are there. The simpler way, I, I normally tell people, a simpler way of doing it. Simple way is, think this body of ours, physical body, is a house we live in. And we are living in different places in this house. There are six floors. I divide the house into six floors because of six energy centers that occur, the six chakras that enter in this body. They regulate our life, they regulate our connections, they regulate our experiences. So we can think the body has six centers, the bottom, the genitals, the navel, the heart, the throat and the eyes. So there are six floors of this house we live in. And we close our eyes and imagine it's a house. And where are we? On the sixth floor. What is on the sixth floor? Whatever we like to make with our imagination. We make a beautiful chamber for our meditation. We make a nice place, put a beautiful chair, rug, carpet, whatever we like. Whatever we are doing outside, do it inside. At the place where you already are, in the wakeful state. So once you make a nice place to meditate inside, this meditation chamber, you will discover this was the only place where you could successfully meditate. The location is very important. We are constantly using outside places, outside away from ourselves, to do things what we are supposed to do to discover our own self. That is why it's the most important part of meditation to meditate at the correct location, which is inside your head, behind the eyes, as a third eye center, where you are already operating from in the wakeful state. Make a beautiful imaginary chamber here. Make a beautiful meditation place. Your temple, your church, your synagogue, your mosque is right here. Not outside the buildings we make, we are made them. This is made by the Creator. This real place of worship, this real place where God exists Himself, is made by God himself. So go where the right place is to meditate. Stay in the center. And what will happen? Supposing you do all the things there. You read books there. You dance there. You sing there. You say prayers there. You sing your hymns there. You sing your songs there. You invite friends there. You have your tea parties there. What will happen if you do all this imaginary thing? You are functioning there. Everything you do there is good meditation. Not repetition of words alone. Anything that pulls your attention to the third eye center behind the eyes is good meditation so long as it's pulling and involving you, the same self that you thought was the body. The same self has pulled itself and come there. The imaginative self that has come there, when you do all activities there, what is actually happening is you are withdrawing your attention right to that same place. And that's the secret of discovering yourself. Withdrawal of your attention to the third eye center where you belong when you are in the wakeful state in this body. Of course, there are other means by which you can also achieve such results. But they are all taking place by sitting there, first of all. Once you are seated there, you will have some problems. That you will try to think of doing things there, but the mind will force you to remember things that are outside because of your attachments and desires. So to overcome that problem, the problem of your mind going out all the time, you can use a device called repetition of mantras or repetition of words. The words we repeat are not really magical words that are going to take us anywhere. But these are words that do not have an association with the outside things. And yet we want to repeat them there continuously so that we do not allow the mind to think of other things. The space that the mind occupies 
in thoughts. We try to cover the same space by repeating the words with our thoughts, not with the tongue. If we repeat the words only with the tongue, hold the beads in our hands and keep on moving the beads in our hands and repeat the word, the tongue, no value whatsoever. A waste of time. If you want to find yourself, it's a total waste of time to put all your attention on your hands and on your tongue. Your mind is still driving you crazy going all over the world. Try it out. I've done it for a long time. It doesn't work. The mind must repeat the words that are given to you. Why not repeat any words that you like? I often give the example that when I came to United States first time, there used to be ye old shaky's pizza, which I saw first time. I liked the taste and more than the taste, I liked the little slogan they wrote on the walls. Like bank make no cheese pizza and we make no change, something like that. So I liked those sayings on the wall and enjoyed the pizza. And one day I said, I am getting attached to Shakey's pizza. Now supposing I were to make Shakey's pizza my mantra, I can keep on repeating Shakey's pizza, I'll always be outside to Shakey's pizza. Therefore, words that have significance only in our outside experience can never serve the purpose of blocking thoughts from going out. That is why we go to these masters, we go to gurus and they say, give us a mantra and they give us some odd words which we don't even understand. And by repeating those words, which have no significance outside, they may have some significance inside. By repeating those words, we are able to replace the words of thought and restrict the space for thoughts. If we repeat long enough and repeat with a very difficult form of repetition, which means listening to what you are repeating. Repetition is one thing. But listening to what you are repeating is the next step. What happens when you listen to the words you are repeating inside? You will notice that the mind always speaks. And you listen. That who are you? Who is the listener? Let me tell you, the listener is yourself. The listener is the soul. The soul is always a listener. The mind is always the speaker in the head. We have clear distinction. The mind speaks, the soul listens. So when you repeat those words with the mind and listen with the soul, two things happen. One, listening draws attention faster back there than speaking. Therefore, by listening to them, you are creating a greater chance of more rapidly pulling your attention back to the third eye center. And what's the second benefit? A bigger benefit? If you start listening to the words you are repeating, you will find there are a lot of other musical go tones going on inside also available to listen. We all have so much beautiful music going on inside us. So many sounds being generated by the self. There's a sound of the self inside us. We never heard because we never put attention on it. But if you practice listening to words you are repeating, it makes you a listener of yourself because it's happening close to the self. It's happening as a third eye center. So the listening to the words you repeat, which is the next best step after repeating the words, that when you start listening, you are drawing your attention further to yourself and you will suddenly start hearing many sounds inside. The sounds of many kinds sound like wind blowing, sound like a train passing somewhere, sound like an echo of a train, sound like a thunder sometimes, sound like rain falling, sound like crickets chirping, sounds like little bells ringing, and sometimes we hear behind these sounds a sound like the large big bell ringing. Dong, dong, the peal of the bell. 
it's normally it's heard after a lot of listening to other sounds but when the bell sound is heard that's the closest to yourself coming from the self and how will you know it's closest coming from yourself it will pull you to yourself faster than any other method this is beautiful that if you are pulled by the sound of yourself there no greater way no easier way to go to yourself and the self resounds by the way <coughs> it's an audible sound that means we can hear it it's coming from the self is coming from the reality is coming from the ultimate truth it only appears like sound because we are sitting in the world in a physical self trying to listen to sound of spoken words and we become listeners of sounds we listen to music outside and we can listen to music inside and because we become listening to something audible and the self becomes audible to us therefore isn't it a surprise that people describing the origin of the universe have described it as a sound something that is audible so amazing in the bible john in his opening verses says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god people ask me is there any definition of god anywhere i said the clearest definition in the john's gospel in the bible the word was god what does it mean how can a word be god how can a word be a creator what is the meaning of a word i said let me see what a powerful word this is with w capital and so i looked up in the dictionary oxford dictionary columbus columbia dictionary and they said the word with a capital w meant the bible a book compiled 200 years after jesus christ revised almost completely in the 7th century written by human beings and we call it the word that is god how can we make sense of it what is the relationship between calling god himself the creator of the whole universe omnipresent omnipotent omniscient knowing everything is a word didn't john realize what he was saying by calling it a word but they were you look at an earlier version of books like the rig veda of the indian old traditional scriptures rig veda says in the beginning was the nod the sound same thing and the sound was the creator and all things in almost a translation of the same words of john's gospel in islamic literature they say it was bange asmani a sound from the sky that created where is this coming from what's the common thing between sound and word and these only one common thing it is audible it can be heard and why is god described as one that can be heard because god sits inside the ultimate self and the self in the human body in physical world can be heard simple you will know the exact definition of what is meant by the word if you listen to the sound within your own self because the sound is not sound at the god level it is sound at the physical level these scriptures have been written for guidance at the physical level and that is why they are referring to the very creative power is available to us in physical form in the form of something that is audible can be heard and what can be heard is the self only when we are able to reach a little bit closer to the self than merely saying the covering upon the self of a physical body is the self or sense perception that are being used are the self or the mind that is thinking about things is the self when we are confused to that extent we are not listening to the self but when we are able to remember these are covers upon the self 
and the self functions continuously using these three things behind the eyes and we go sit there comfortably and listen you're listening to god and the self it does not always remain like that let me tell you why listening is so important in in the scriptures which great master baba saban singh my mentor my master my greatest master without whom i could never be telling you any of these things his teachings alone have transformed my life and given me what i have he used to explain that we call the word the sound the nod the shabd the all meaning the same thing all are audible things we call them like that only because they are audible at the physical level and are we using it every day we are all using it you are using it now i am talking to you you are listening but these are words which are spoken which can be written so they were described as spoken and written words and were called varnatmak varnatmak shabd shabd means sound varnatmak means that which can be varnan which can be spoken or written so varnatmak shabd is the beginning of our understanding of the word understanding the sound but when we listen to the spoken words the next step is to listen to the words inside ourselves still varnatmak the first step to discovering what's inside you is to listen to words of mantra which are also made up by us and that is also listening to the words to the sound but spoken words varanatmak but when you move from varanatmak to the sound of the bells and those musical sound that come words disappear and the music alone becomes the sound then we don't call it varanatmak anymore then we call it dhunatmak dhun means a melody a tone that's going on so the melodious music that we can hear is the next step it starts with varanatmak and we move on to dhunatmak which means that it is now a sound that can be heard need not be spoken words at all no language is needed for those sounds next step what happens at the astral plane we hear that dhunatmak if we can meditate within our imaginary self go within the head of our imaginary self that has been meditating behind the eyes all these years we go within that with simple meditation or with drawing your attention imagining you are inside that head you know what will happen your perception will open up and you will find sense perceptions were merely an extension of your perception you open up a mental side of yourself the mind functions there that's your causal self when you reach the causal self what happens to the sound the sound changes you do not then feel that you are now listening to words now it has become a musical sound you feel you were hearing a musical sound continuously all the time but didn't know about it that you just left somewhere the sound was there 24/7 all the time an endless sound a sound with no beginning sound with no end and you were always listening to it your form there was always listening if you hadn't shut yourself away from there and come here you would be listening all the time 24/7 therefore the name of the sound changes from dhun atmak shabd we call it anhad shabd anhad means no beginning no end is a continuous sound so there's a wonderful change that has taken place of the same sound we called as varanatmak spoken word the word has now become an endless sound what happens next next we cannot achieve anything next with meditation we reach the end of meditation now what pulls us beyond that is what is beyond that beyond our mind love pulls us that is why when we meet perfect living masters 
those who have attained state of being beyond the mind they do not operate through words they operate through love they pull us through love we want to hear them our mind wants to hear them and all the time while we are hearing them they are pulling us with their love they are not only pulling us here in the physical world in the astral world in the causal world they are pulling us right from beyond the mind when such a human being whom we call a perfect living master who is no different than us is born like us dies like us lives like us eats food like us falls sick like us goes to hospital like us is just like us has a destiny and karma like us the only difference between such a person and ourselves is his awareness has gone to the highest highest form beyond the mind and he has discovered himself that's all is something inside him something in his awareness but how that affects us is that when he speaks to us he does not speak from the awareness over here and nor does he use any learning that he has got here he speaks directly from what he knows from his own being at that time that means he is in all levels of awareness 24/7 that's a perfect living master in his presence he pulls us with the love inside our own self because he knows we are all one and he's operating at that level so he is pulling us from inside our own self he is inside us not outside we see him outside and the pull even appears to be like a pull of love outside so amazing his method of taking us to a true home is not by teaching us anything but by taking us with love beyond the mind there used to be a professor i've been giving this example last several times that there used to be a professor intellectual professor who used to come to great master and used to say master all that you're teaching is all made up stuff there is no proof of it there is no higher state of being or higher state of living there is no true home or anything that you talk about it's all nonsense just made up by group of you people called gurus it's a conspiracy to deceive people and to take their money away and to exploit them please don't deceive the people don't do that i have come to request you for that the great master said professor you have a right to your opinion based upon your own experience my experience is a little different therefore i have to go with my experience and i believe that there are things beyond what we can see here but i am very happy uh, that you giving your honest opinion to me thank you professor went away next sunday he was back again to tell the great master the same thing again master i am telling you there is no evidence for all the things you are saying we are living in a rational world we are living in a very world run by scientists run by people with their brain they have used their world there is no evidence why are you misleading people and the great master again said professor you came last week and i told you that your experience is limited to what you are seeing and therefore you are going with that experience and expressing your opinion to me i have a different experience therefore we can hold disagreement because of our different experiences but thank you very much for your honesty in expressing your opinion the professor went away next sunday he was back again and said the same thing great master said professor you came two times earlier to tell me the same thing and you come third time to say the same thing and i said we disagree on something professor said i don't know but i love to come and see you again and again <laughs> what was happening mind was resisting mind was saying the whole thing is nonsense the heart was being pulled the soul was being pulled by the master he became one of the finest disciples of great master he became a good friend of mine so i used to meet him so it's wonderful how the masters come and it's the love that the master shows is so unconditional so different from the love we have normally experienced because most of the time what we call love here is merely an attachment merely infatuation merely being attracted to something and we call it love 
the way we love people the way we love things always is, is expressed like i love you i love my house i love my car i love you very much do you realize what these phrases are saying i love you i love my car i love you very much i is very strong in all of these have you noticed that these are really coming from the ego of iness do you also realize that every time a person says i love you he is clearly showing his awareness i is separate from you if you separate what is love now what happens when we truly fall in love first thing is we become speechless we can't even say the words i love you then what happens our thoughts imaging is about the beloved not of the eye at one time i wanted to examine in this physical world is there something that can push this i behind somewhere because everything we do i am doing this i am meditating i am trying this i am finding the truth i love you i am doing this i love god everything was i i i all ego i say is there nothing in this world that can push this i away and i found the only thing that pushes this i away is an actual experience of true love when true love comes the beloved takes place as it places the i that we can't think of i we think of the beloved first there is a person saying i sometime use it farsi ishq awal dar dil e mashuk paida me shawad love is first born in the heart of the beloved the beloved pulls and we can't think of the i but the beloved that's true love so love is very different from what we have been used to calling it but when we meet a perfect living master our eye suddenly disappears the pull is so much because the love of a perfect living master is totally completely unconditional no condition at all a perfect living master never says be a good boy be a good girl and i love you he never says your karma is too bad you don't deserve love never he never judges anything in us that love is without any judgment whatsoever a perfect living master once he comes in your life and he loves you he will love you if you love him he will, he will love you if you don't love him he will love you if you hate him and he will love you if you kill him that's the kind of unconditional love of a perfect living master it affects us and we don't even sometimes know why it's affecting us the reason is that love is not directed at our bodies it is nothing to do with our flesh it has nothing to do with our sense perceptions it has nothing to do with our mind it has nothing to do with our thoughts is directly soul to soul is from self to self that love is coming from that where love comes from to where love is actually going so it's a true love and that is why this perfect living masters come here for nothing else except to give us the experience of true love and they pull us with that love we see it outside and more than that we see it inside so that is why the this is a real path of spirituality is a path of love and devotion and not of teaching or explaining how to meditate but sometimes these masters also speak to us and tell us how to meditate why is that if all their job is to come and love us and take us back home to our true self or true nature why do they become teachers of meditation also simply to satisfy our minds meditation of any kind whatsoever is only for the mind and meditation of any kind whatsoever yoga of any kind whatsoever is only to take you up to the universal mind up to the causal stage of awareness let me see any meditation any kind of yoga anywhere in the world i have searched for it that can take you beyond except that which is called love
प्योर लव टेक्स यू बियॉन्ड प्योर लव पुल्स यू बियॉन्ड द माइंड माइंड कैन नॉट पुल्स यू बियॉन्ड द माइंड एंड ऑल मेडिटेशन इज डन विद द माइंड नो मैटर वॉट सो दैट इज वाई दिस परफेक्टली मैस्टर द रेयर वाई आर द रेयर बिकॉज we ourselves are very few seekers looking for what they are t- telling us <laughs> now somebody was crawling here and i was i, I, I was trying to be a little defensive <laughs> perfect living masters are a great example of purity of love and the true love stay with them examine them let the minds doubt as much as it likes the love will overcome all doubts so that is why they say the real spiritual path is love and devotion now i brought in second word devotion why not love why love and devotion where devotion come from devotion is an automatic reaction to true love when you experience true love you become a devotee by itself it's a natural phenomenon it's a response to love that is why when we experience that love the devotion doesn't have to be practiced it comes naturally to us when we go through various phases of our life and find that a master who comes to our life has taken care of so much of our life we become automatically devoted every day we see the presence of the master because he represents our own self when the soul is pulled by love attention is pulled by love the mind is left behind and our consciousness is pulled beyond the mind the sound which we were calling the unheard shabd the endless sound is stilled into silence because all sound requires space and time and there is no space and time beyond the mind then why are we still calling it sound because there for the first time we discover there is sound was the self it is not coming from the self it was the self that is why the importance of the word the word is god because god lies within that self it's a great experience and therefore the name of the sound is changed is no longer called anhad shabd it's called sar shabd real shabd which means the self there the discovery is made that it is our own self that was the sound and the self which is total consciousness which is not mind not thought not space time none of this creation nothing that we are experiencing here except very rarely when it comes right through this experience in the form of three things love flows even through these barriers of the mind sense perceptions physical body we still feel it is coming from beyond the mind and still feeling it here what the second form in which we are feeling our own self is called intuition what is intuition gut feeling knowing something instantaneously without time and not knowing where it's coming from the mind is saying one thing intuition is saying something different it's coming from the same source which is beyond the mind intuition is very important is a part of our self we live a life here completely guided by the mind completely guided by our thoughts and intuition come hunches come to us cut feelings come to us don't do this or do this and we reason it out and get out of it because very often the intuition that comes to us is at variance with what the mind is saying so we rather go with the mind than the intuition of course till the next day i wish i had listened to my gut feeling when we find something went wrong how does that happen how come the mind goes wrong and the intuition was correct the simple reason for that reason is mind acts on the data available to it which is very limited 
Next day, new data comes, mind was wrong. Intuition doesn't function from that data at all. Intuition functions from totality of the data stored right from the beginning of time, all stored inside you. Intuitive feelings do not come from the present data in front of you. The mind searches for present data, intuition comes from within and carries with it the complete information stored in you from the time of creation itself. So that is why if we were to change our life in a very simple way, let your decisions be made intuitively and use your mind to carry them out, you will bring heaven upon earth right now. But we don't do that. We have intuitive feelings, we reject them because of the reasoning of the mind and then we make a mess of everything and we say, oh, we are sorry, we are so full of guilt and regrets in our life. Where does this come from? Where do regrets and guilt come from? All mistakes we have made. How did we make mistakes? Because we are guided by a simple computer that is installed in us called a mind and we gave it higher importance than our own self. That's why we are all messing up our life. We did not come here for that purpose. The soul never came into the creation to get, a, get it messed up with the mind. It came to have a great new experience. Of course, a roller coaster experience. It likes high and low, not a boredom experience of boredom and one, and one continuous thing. High and low, sometimes good times, bad times, high, low, great roller coaster. We came for that to enjoy this great experience in the three worlds the world of the mind, the world of senses, and the world with the combination with the physical world. We came for having an adventure and go back home. That is the whole purpose of creation and purpose of life here. What did we do? Just because we wanted to create each level as its own reality, which was done very successfully by blocking the awareness of other forms of realities, including our own self, hiding it inside our own self and just looking outside to have this adventure. We thought this is the only reality. Got so trapped in this, a show set up by us to enjoy became life for us. And we began to do the suffering of life and the ups and downs are the most important things of our life. We forgot that we are coming to watch a show and go back home. How can we be making such a big mistake of saying these are mine created things temporarily in a human body, which is such a short life between birth and death, not even a hundred years available, maybe 120, not even that available. And in a cosmic time of billions of years, for this short period, this is my house, this is my property, this is my jewelry, this is my people, this is my friend, these are my children, this is my parent. What have we done? The show ends, nothing is mine. Nothing whatsoever has ever gone with us when we die. And we all die without exception. So many enlightened people have come. Prophets have come, masters have come, all kinds of people teaching us the reality of endless time and they also have gone away. Nobody holds on to physical bodies and physical things and we are trying to amass these physical wealths outside and saying this is all mine and mine. Do you know what we are doing? We are creating completely unnecessary attachments. So that when we die, oh, I have left mine behind, I have to go back. And we go back again and again to the same place. We don't go home. We are just circling around in the same place, just circling around in this universe because we get so attached to things which can never become our own. Why don't we say these are wonderful things we have got to use? They have been gifted to us. They made our life worthwhile. They made the adventure great. But they are not mine. They belong to who gave us and we will go away. We came with nothing, we will die with nothing. And these don't belong to us. They are here for our good use and enjoyment. If we just make this little change in our head, our life will change. 
and we'll be able to go back home. So that is why we have ourselves imprisoned ourselves over here. We have imprisoned ourselves with these attachments and trying to make things our own which can never become our own. Enjoy them. They will be given temporarily. We go to an amusement park. We enjoy. Children go with us. Children enjoy. They don't say this horse that is going around up and down is mine. I am going to take it with me. No, it's just for their temporary use. This is a huge carnival going on around us. Enjoy. Go back home. Not that this should be something that you are trying to possess and say it is mine. The problem does not come by using things. Problem does not come by enjoying things. Problem does not come by enjoying people, enjoying company, enjoying everything. Problem comes when you try to make it mine. And there is no use in this. Have a little change of attitude just based upon a simple experience. We will all die. Nobody has carried anything with us. And how are we going to carry anything with us? So just a little change can make a change in our life. Because we suffer a lot because of trying to make things our own. And the suffering we can't even see because we come back again and again because of these attachments and desires that we create for something that are intended to be temporary. They're supposed to be temporary. So let us not waste our time trying to make these things our own. We have a great chance and opportunity in a human body to become seekers. Seeking is the secret. If you seek the ultimate truth, if you seek your true home beyond the mind, I guarantee to you a perfect living master will appear in your life without your trying to find him. The reason being, you can never find one. We can find many masters. They wear costumes, they wear several kinds of dresses, they carry some kind of a sign and placard that they are masters. Perfectly we master don't carry anything. They are just like us. Why are perfectly we masters not carrying some placard that they are perfectly we masters? Why don't they carry it? Like so many other gurus and other uh, enlightened people said to seem to show that they are masters, they want to teach us something. Why don't they do it? They don't do it because they have not come for that purpose at all. They have not come to teach. They have heard our cry of seeking. They have heard us because they are at the same level internally where our soul is. And they have appeared in our life. In India, we say, when a chela is ready, a guru appears. When a disciple is ready, a master appears. They don't say when a disciple is ready, he'll find one. You can find many masters. And maybe they were necessary for you to find masters fulfilling certain desires, wishes of yours, fulfilling certain amount of searching and seeking of yours. Masters come. But only when you seek something like a true home, when you're ready, a perfect living master is bound to appear in your life by coincidence. By circumstances, not by your choice. The perfect living master appears when you are ready. When are you ready? You are ready when you think you had enough. If you think you haven't had enough, spend little more time, enjoy little more. A few more lifetimes won't make a difference when we had so many earlier. If you still feel that this is a great place to have a good time, have a good time. But when you feel, I am done, I have had enough of it, this is not my place, I know I want to go to my true home, then these feelings come inside you, then you become a seeker of the ultimate truth, then a perfect living master always appears in your life, no matter where you are. So I am sharing all these things with you, I am very happy I was able to come and spend time with you and share these experiences with you. Not these intellectual concepts or thoughts which you can find plenty in the books. I wanted to tell you something that's practical. And I included some of these tips about the most important things to realize yourself. One, know the exact location where you have to meditate. It's not outside, behind the eyes. Secondly, you're always at the third eye center and all you have to do is to imagine the whole of you is there. 
Third point, use repetition of words, words that don't have an outside association to block the mind, not merely repeating with the words with beads in your hand. Next step, if you hear a sound, drop the words, hear the sound of the self. The rest of the guidance will come to you automatically from the master who will find you before that time, before you reach that point. So I wish you all great luck and all the blessings and I'm very happy to see you.